mostly viewed as those pious people who seem to be against everyone, everything. Now you may not think that, but that's how they see young people by and large, just in the general population, see Christians in a very negative uh, view. You may not have known that, but they do. Um, so, what we may perceive as standing for godly standards, the millennium, <laughs> it's hard to say, are much more likely to see this as getting in the way of progressive progress. Alright? We okay so far? Now, if we hold, for instance, that marriage is a state that is ordained by God to be between a man and a woman, they have no reference point for this point of view. Because they have no particular deference to our God. So just because we believe that, there's nothing, they don't have any particular reason to go along with that. You follow what I mean now? And so what happens is, um, uh, I saw a program recently where it was about young persons, and they were about 30, and there was a Jewish person, a Muslim, and there was a Christian person, and then we also had a, someone, a self-avowed um, humanist, secular humanist, and they all had this wonderful dialogue going on about what was important and what needed to happen, and how to find ways to see each other's point of view so that they could attain to a common ground and everyone could agree on the things that were valuable to seek for in life, and to be able to go forward in that way in unity, if you follow what I'm saying. And, and that was their point of view. And you know, on the surface, when you first hear that, you think, oh, isn't that a wonderful sort of, <laughs> sounding people are already shaking their head, isn't that a wonderful sort of delightful way to be? And, uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and not so much as the way I would, I would say that. Um, so they want to forge a better future for this world. They think that they are progressively able to do that. And so this is the natural man seeking to work out his own salvation. This is not new on the earth. Can we say amen to that? Amen. This happened at the Tower of Babel and the other places where folks all wanted to come together into a place of agreement. So this is, um, and this notion will take on great acceptance. As times become more urgent, people will say that all Christians do is bring difficulty and visions, all that we really need to work to everybody. There's so many diverse groups. You can't just be your own little person any longer. You all need to work together. We're going to have a one world religion. Already those seeds are in our society. They are. And so great acceptance and vast number of people will be open to this idea. Interestingly to me, at least this is a perspective that sees unity and cooperation as the greatest good. Unity and cooperation is the greatest good. From a Christian perspective, we are not so much interested in everyone agreeing per se. No, we're interested in truth. And truth divides. Yeah. That's hard to hear, but truth divides. When truth comes into a home, those who are for the truth go to it. And those who are against the truth are repelled by it. That's how it works. But you have to hear the truth. So from a Christian vantage point, it's not about unity, although... Unity is important for Christians who are Christians, but not for um, the sense of society. It's not how we're supposed to be necessarily. Um, so with this reality that I've spoken just of now as a start, starting place, how will we gain a footing with this generation? How will we gain a place where we have some way to speak to them? That's an important question for you and for me, I would say. Some will say that the whole idea is to spread the gospel. We need to witness to people who aren't believers. And I say yes to that. And I say a hearty amen to that. And there are always, this is important, there are always those persons whose God has worked, who God has worked on their heart. They're at a place of grace. When they hear the gospel, they will say yes. That's important to hear that along with the truth, that while that is true, there is an ever-widening uh, gap and divide between Christians and the rest of society. Right. Can we say amen to that? Yeah. So both of those are true, if you follow what I'm saying, which means that some people will come, but there's a greater and greater divide, so what do we do? Now this is a little tough here, but here we go. It's like medicine, you have to sort of swallow hard a little bit. First, we will need to realize and take ownership of the reality that the overall witness as Christians that we do give to the world 
is indeed a being against. Most persons younger, 35 and down, really do perceive. They're not just making it up. They really do perceive yeah. Christians being against stuff. Yeah. So we have to own that. We can't say, oh, they're mixed up and they don't get it and they, you know, they're just selfish. We can't say any of that. Right. We have to own that. That's, that's what the impression we're giving them. And you say, no, no, it's not. The media falsifies and this and this. Well, there's a little of that. But at the same time, there's a lot of truth in it. That's what we do seem to do most of the time. Stand against things. Yeah. From their vantage point. You see that? Yeah. So, you might say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. Are you saying we should just abandon our standards and simply capitulate to what the world says? And the answer, of course, is no. But we do have to own we do have to own the reality that the primary witness that the Christian church in America gives is pretty much to be stiff-necked and against things. Yeah. It's kind of bitter medicine, isn't it? Like, no, I don't say no, we do a lot of good. No. Yes, but that's not what's seen. Right. What's seen is being against things. Yeah. Now, <laughs> so, Another reality in the 21st century church has to deal with the issue of what the Bible prescribes as our Christian walk and what actually is occurring in the Western church. Here's another place where there's a divide. For many Christians, and I'm not saying this is you or even anybody you know, but if you're even close to this, then there's a danger sign that will walk in your heart, I hope, today. For many Christians, being a Christian is a matter of being in agreement with Christian dogma. This is our belief system. Do you follow what I'm saying? We are in agreement with Christian ethics. We assent to the right Christian perspective. Um, we don't believe in this, and we do believe in the other thing. You follow what I mean? That, that, that pretty well defines many, many Christians. Often Christians tend to judge those who disregard our viewpoint. We judge them as being... Now, how can they think that way? Have you ever felt that before? Yes, yes. I have. So nobody gives me, give me something. Amen. Amen. That's very interesting. Yeah. I don't even care if it's pity or mercy. Just give me something. I just need a little bit. So I'm here. <laughs> um, here. So, um, we, we, uh, we tend to judge those who disregard our point of view. We get annoyed with people because they won't comply with the Bible. But the Bible says so. They say, so what? And we get annoyed. Because that's our trump card, right? Yeah, that's true. That's our trump card. They say, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so we're out of cards that we don't want to do. <laughs> that's kind of where, what happens. Um, to, the, to the degree that this is a foundational reality in our Christian experience, then what is there about this way of thinking, about having a point of view and saying, I believe this or I believe that? What is there about this way of thinking that in any way distinguishes us from any other religion or any other social point of view? The all we've got to tell people is, I believe this and I believe that because the Bible says so. And they said, so what? I believe this and I believe that because I say so. If that's all we've got, if that is all we've got, and how are we bearing witness? Come on. Amen. If that is all we have, is it Amen. standing on our own, unknown to us sometimes, self-judgment, self-righteousness, because I have the Bible and you don't. Not only is that not bearing witness in the positive, it is likely to be bearing witness in the negative. Because they're likely the more likely to see or perceive us as being somewhat sooty, snooty or um, superior in some way. And so they might just accommodate you a little bit and say, well, that's nice, but make a decision. I don't want any part of that. Right. So I don't know what distinguishes us, but that's all we have. If our Christian experience is primarily a matter of assenting to Christian dogma, assenting to the Christian belief system, that I say, I believe this or I believe that, I believe Christ died and was raised again, therefore I'm a Christian, and that defines me. If that's all I have, then I will not be able to bear witness in this world. Because people don't care 
if that's what you have. Amen. You can try to stuff that down their throat. They'll just get angry and run off and get hardened that they're just never going to be part of any of that. Many young persons, even in church, have had a sort of a ramming down their throat of religion. And it's so mistakeful, it might be half their life before they're able to have a decent ability to accommodate truth in here in an unjaded way, if you follow what I mean. So what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? So here's the deal. <laughs> in Luke 9, 23, the Bible says this. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So to witness for Christ means that we are to give evidence to what reality? To the reality that we are denying ourselves. So God is saying the world needs to see you denying yourself. I mean, they, uh, we, that doesn't get preached too much. Uh, that we're enduring the cost of sacrifice to follow after Christ. We don't really want to hear sacrifice being preached. Well, maybe maybe that's wrong and prejudicial to say that. Maybe there's part of us that does because we know it's truth. And then there's another part of us that's not so sure about that because we know immediately there's a cost involved in this. And I've been able to be in that happy place where I can agree with the gospel without doing anything about it. Right. Oh, no, you didn't say that, preacher. Yes, I did. So being a follower of Christ, and finally we are to do what Christ has called us to do. Those three things. That's what it means. That's what it means to bear witness. That's what it means. He says that you, you must deny yourself, take up your cross. That's the sacrificial part, the cost of it, and follow me. Do what I've asked you to do. Christ is saying for you to bear witness to me. Yes, we are supposed to verbally bear witness. And yes, if a person is open and receptive and a person wants to hear it, the power of the gospel remains the power of the gospel. But I'm talking about people who are not interested in the gospel. Can we say amen? amen. God's interested in the people who are not interested. Right. This is the role and the purpose of God's church. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And I believe this to be so that the gospel has become so corrupted by preachers who want to ensure that folks um, will come back to church and they fall into the bless me, increase me, advance me, enrich me, preaching. Now I'm not saying that God doesn't want to do those things. But there's an order in which those things should occur in your life. And if we get them first on the agenda, or preachers allow this to be first on the agenda, people will come in with this desire. And so what will the preacher stand for? For satisfying that desire or for the truth? Which way will it be? Many times. So in this case that I've described, the gospel has become a bless me story. We become the central character and Christ is our benefactor. You follow? Now, if you think, well, preacher, you're on your soapbox today, so be it. Amen. Amen. I'm serious now, so be it. Amen. So much of today's life is harsh, and there is a vital need for true deliverance, true healing in the body, our body. Amen. But when, when, when will become the people? We become the people where others can see that we are formerly this. Do we ever get to the place where we formerly were this, but now we're that? Does the does the Christian body ever get to that place where we all say, or many of us say, or those who walk with God for a little bit, formerly we were this way, but now we're no longer this way? Let me read Ephesians 2 and 1 and following a little bit. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, 
of the Spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even um, as the rest. The God being rich in mercy because of his great love for us, which uh, he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you can say, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It is saying that the work of Christ in our lives should be so uh, definitive, and so powerful, so real in our relationship to him and the absolute nature of surrender that something so transformative should occur where we get to the place not too far along where we say formerly I was this way but now I'm that way yeah. and it's difficult to see that in the Christian church yeah. we desire it we desire it but do we get there he spoke to me this morning about weakness we struggle with weakness he wants to strengthen us. He wants to change us. He wants to give us a true vision into the power of the Holy Spirit. The reality of what it means to be wrong to Him in obedience and in sacrifice. The reality of it. To whereby these things can't be past tense. Some of us need to have some things in our lives that are past tense. And He wants to do it. We have to proclaim it. We have to preach it. We have to say it. Otherwise, no one will believe for it. I listened to, and you probably think I've lost my mind about this one. I'll be fine. I listened to a young woman on Christian radio last week. She had called in to ask for advice and encouragement because. Even though she was a Christian, she was frightened to bring a child into the world as a single mom. And so, what do we do? See the dilemma in this. See the dilemma in this. If non-Christians were listening, perhaps they might think this was a good thing for a young person to be accepted and not judged. And I do too. And I think you do too. Yeah. Yet, where is the witness on the other side? Now, I'm not her judge. God's her judge. I'm not her judge. I've said it over and over again. But I do remember things like this in my walk. For God had relieved me from cigarettes and from um, um, whiskey and booze and alcohol and all that. And in a difficult scrape, about 15 months after he had taken me away from cigarettes, I went back to it. And when I got back to it, was trapped in it, I was grieved beyond measure. Yes, yes. And you know why? Yes. For the sake of my witness. Yes. I was grieved beyond measure that what God had done for me, I had counted as cheap. Yes. What God had done for me was a slack thing and it was cheap grace. And I was walking around secretly smoking. And I'm not condemning anybody who smokes now. I'm just saying God had taken it from me. Amen. But the nature of the witness in it was so grievous to me that I did not want to be that person before God. Amen. I wanted to be able to say God has done this for me and he's helped me in it. And I did not want to be the one who was doing this thing. And it troubled me. Now I'm not her. I'm not, I'm not her judge, but I tell you, she called in and there was not a thread, a slightest thread of any sort of sense of remorse. I'm not saying she had to be shameful, but there was no sense that what kind of witness does this make? Do you follow what I mean? Right. None whatsoever. Yeah. You think you're being harsh, preacher? I'm not. I'm trying to divide the truth. Yeah. You follow? I'm trying to divide it. Because we all accommodate the other side. Everyone does it. Everyone has family members who are doing this, or doing that, or doing the other things. So we accommodate it. Let's have an amen there. Amen. And it's difficult. It really, really is difficult. And what God is saying is, in the midst of all this stuff going on, stand for that which I have given you. Stand for truth. Stand for it. Where has your conscience gone in the Christian church? Where is it gone? It's gone nowhere. I don't know where it is. Now, 
See, now you're saying, well, you're just one of those who's against everything, aren't you? <laughs> There's this danger. We need to stand. <clears throat> but we need to stand out of a pure heart and pure conscience for Christ. We need to stand for Christ. Not because it's our big, bad opinion. And there's a great, great, great difference. So, um, so um, the idea of sex and lust and greed and selfishness and judgment and materialism, all these things were called a set down. But they're rampant in the church. Right. Now, the difficulty is, is you know, people are lost in it. You have to be merciful. You have to be loving. And you have to say, yes, we need one another to be honest. Right. And to hold on to one another and say, we are all walking out of it. We're walking. We can't just let it be under the radar pretending nothing is wrong. You follow? We need to have power and reality and love to accept but to change. To say, formerly, I was there and now I'm here. Unless we have a mindset that says, formerly, but now this. We must do this for Christ's sake, for His honor and His glory. It's not about us, it's not. It's about the glory of Almighty God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Um, Self-discipline, holiness, kindness, love, serving others, sacrifice, visibly loving and having devotion for God. That's what we're called to take up and to become. One set down, the other is to become. And to clearly make a distinction, not to wallow around in the middle, because that's what society does. And we have no, we have no sort of clear direction of where we're going. We just come and get blessed and come and sing, and it's wonderful, it is wonderful. We want to rejoice in Jesus, but there has to be something purposeful about where we're going. In reality, church, as we see it in the West, we don't think this way. We don't, we don't think sacrifice. Who thinks like that? Prosperity and increase. Mostly we think like that. It says this in Matthew 5 and 16. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and what? And glorify your Father who is in heaven. God is giving us a principle here. He said, let the Christ in you be so vivid and real. The reality, the boldly the reality of Christ in you so vivid and so real. The light shine before men in such a way, vivid and real, that they may see your good works. What is being said here is, if you're an assenting um, to the doctrine of Christ, you're in a center. That's what you are. But if there are no works in your life, then you're not a believer. You think, oh, don't say that, preacher. Well, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says if you have uh, faith without works, that's not really faith. That's just a belief system. The church is rampant with a belief system. I hold this belief, I hold that belief. But that's not faith. Right. Faith that is anchored in Jesus Christ of what He has done for us is faith that is active and alive and does stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Faith by its very nature works. It does work by its nature. Yeah. If you have no works in your life, you have no faith in your life. Yeah. Where are you this morning? Amen. If you've been nursed along in this crazy notion that you said these words, that I believe in my heart, Jesus is Lord, that I am saved. Wonderful. That's a start. But did you really mean that? Because if He's Lord, you're supposed to be working for Him. Amen. Otherwise, it's just a set of sort of beliefs. It's not faith. <laughs> is He a good God? He's a good God. You see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Um, where's your name? Okay, stand up here, your name. 
Speak loudly to this congregation. You want this? Wherever you want. Um, he wanted me to share about Friday morning. I was privileged to be part of the um, Solomon's Porch Outreach Ministry, and it was it is such a special special ministry. It is so sweet. And um, from 6:30 to 8, we they have tables. We have tables set up with food for the children: apples, bananas, donuts, cake, and all kinds of stuff, all kinds of juices. And um, this community all walk by, the children all walk by the tables, and they are able to freely have whatever they want. And um, I just was so touched by how sweet these children are, how precious and how well cared for, and polite, just so polite. But they just are so thankful. Then mothers drive by saying, thank you, thank you for what you're doing. They'll just call it out of their cars as they're driving. They don't even have their own children going there. They're thanking us for whatever children are there. And um, all morning that was happening. And then all of a sudden, a car just pulled in and came from the red light, just pulled on in. I thought, wow, this lady really wants food. She's going the opposite way of all those school children. And she said, she rolled her window down and she said, I want to thank you all and thank you for what you're doing. Thank you that you've been here every week for the children. I'm the principal of Springfield. And she said, our children count on this. They look forward to Fridays. They all talk about Fridays, and they love what you do. They, they need the food. She said, we have children that need that food, that don't have food in the morning. That's their breakfast. That's their food. So um, it's a door that is open to the community and, and the school. She said, we all appreciate you over here. And we said, we pray for you because we, um, uh, Susan, in the morning, and I went with her a year, month ago, and we were all praying for all these schools. And so that's a that thing that she does every morning has been praying for these schools. And um, when the principal said that, she said, we said, we pray for you. We pray for you every day because she's being prayed for all the time. She said, thank you. We need the prayers. We want the prayers. And she said, we bless you and we thank you. And she said, as the principal, I receive those prayers and we thank you for them. And she said, we need them. Keep praying for us. Keep praying for the children. And so I just want to say that is a door that God made out of love. And God, um, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. Sometimes we think we have to do some great thing or some hard thing or some stressful thing. And this is such a joy. And I just would encourage everyone to just come any Friday for any space of time. And can I just say one thing? It's just a door to the community. The hearts are coming. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. <laughs> I want you to keep that in mind that um, Janae is there at times and Russell is there often. Linda Shaughnessy and Susan Brasher. Christine. Christine. Uh, Mary. But through the months and years, God birthing on their heart and, um, and then them beginning it. And uh, not to be in conflict with what you're saying, Janae, but there is sacrifice in it. And there's labor in it. And there's resolve in it. And there's cost in it. And there's determination in it. And those are things that come out of us as humans who are made in the image and likeness of God. And we express godliness in that form. But godliness was observed. Goodness was seen. Could we say amen to that? Let me follow up a little bit. Father in heaven is waiting for us to follow Christ and not ourselves. When we live sacrificially, people of all stripes see Christ in us. I'm going to say that again. When we live sacrificially, people of all stripes see Christ in us. Because he promised that. Take up your cross and walk. He says to do these things and people will see there's a world waiting to see and come to radical and true Christianity. Young persons want to see something that's truly authentic. It's truly authentic, real, and not play-acting. A life devoted to Christ and love and service, sacrificing self-interest and bearing the cost. That's how all of us are called, all, every last one of us are called to walk before Him. Not showing up, and I'm not getting on anyone, not showing up on Sunday for a service and going on. That's not it. Um, I want to say to you, there's such a great difference knowing about Christ 
knowing that and to know him in a deep, personal, and intimate way. And I would say this to you, that what is missing in the life of so many Christians is a personal knowledge of the goodness of God. The goodness of God is what forms us as a son or daughter of God. It is the goodness of God that forms us as a son or daughter of God. And many, many people who are centers, they don't know it, they don't have it, and they don't understand it, and it isn't working in their life. If you're in a center, if you're simply giving mental assent, then these things are not working in your life. Let me just say this to you. I'm proposing that ethical assenters, that is people who merely morally agree with the Bible, don't know the goodness of God, and thereby, and thereby, and thereby, cannot bear witness to His goodness. You follow what I'm saying? If all you have is a belief system, you really don't know the goodness of God because you're not living sacrificial, you're not doing what He's asking you to do, and therefore you really don't know His goodness and you cannot bear witness to the goodness of God. Amen. Are we together? Yes. They just say they believe, but there's no power in their witness. Now I'm going to read you some things. And um, this is Genesis 1 and 11 and, uh, and 12. Then God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seeds, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after its own kind of seed in them. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seeds after their kind, and trees bearing fruit and seed in them after their kind. And God saw it. God saw that it was good. Well, now let me just say in in, in 1 Timothy 4 and 4, the Bible says, For everything created by God is good. So, in God's creation, now I don't want to be silly, jocular, or any way foolish. It was unlikely that God was going to create a cube for the earth. It would be pretty drafty at the corners, you follow what I'm saying. So God was going to create something that was good. It was not possible for him not to create something that was good. You follow? Amen. But the Bible says, and God saw that it was good. What does that mean? Like it was a, oh, revelation to him? No. It's not possible for God not to make something good. Right. So why is that statement in the Bible, and God saw that it was good? I'm going to give you seven or eight seconds there. That statement's in the Bible for your sake and for my sake. That statement's in there for us to come to the realization that this is the truth. And here's the truth. That goodness manifest is so powerful, goodness manifest is so powerful, you cannot escape its witness. Goodness manifest will even witness to Almighty God who made it. Now, you and I are made in His image and likeness. And when His goodness, when it's good, His goodness is made or manifest, no one will be able to deny the power of that witness. No one. Amen. God saw it was good and everybody else can see goodness that is from God. Because God saw it and we can see it too. We're made in His image and His likeness. Can we say amen? amen. That's the only reason that's in there. Hallelujah. 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 It doesn't matter if you're Muslim. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, whoever. <laughs> Hindu. It doesn't matter who you are. What he's saying is, if the goodness of God is manifest, it will bear witness to that person and they will see it and know and glorify God. That's what it says. We are coming to a time and an era where this is what God is asking the church to do. To manifest the goodness of Almighty God. No, there's a cost in this. It's dividing. People do not like to be challenged that coming to God and being in the center is not good enough. But I'm telling you it's not. You have no guarantee of your salvation if that's where you stand today. None whatsoever. If you've walked with God, if you've walked with God for a season, for a season and you can show no good works, how will you say you say it? Right. Tell me. Tell me. Tell Almighty God. How will you say you say it? Without works is not saving faith. It's what kind of faith? Dead faith. So, 
So what is this? What is good? What is good? What's good? I don't know if we need to get into all that, but you kind of know what good is. I just make this don't be, but you'll go along with me. Any moms here? Yeah. A few moms? <laughs> By that, I know that you've all had at least one baby. <laughs> right? How many of you, when your baby showed up, said, boy, that's a bad baby? <laughs> wow, man, that's some bad baby there. Anybody ever said that? <laughs> no one says that. No one ever, ever, ever says that. You are absolutely starstruck in the marvelous goodness and wonder of the miracle of the child that has come to you. Bless the living God. You peer at it. You stare at it. You nurse it. You smell it. You lick it. You, do it. you look at every little notch behind the ear. You look at every little crinkle. I mean, you can't get your hands on it. It's so good. So we kind of know what's good, do we not? When they grow up, our opinion might change a little bit. But right there. So we kind of know. We know what good means. We know it in our hearts. We don't even have to be told. We just know. And we know God is good. And we know how powerful it is. Amen. It's so powerful, the goodness of God. All right. So we don't have to give you a long definition about it. I want to tell you about lunchtime yesterday. I was sitting in my backyard. And uh, I was sitting in a little chair out there. And we're very blessed. God was very, very, very much so <clears throat> blessed in His goodness to provide a place for us to live. And it's very winsome. It's very beautiful. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we worked on it some. And there's about, in our backyard, it's about an acre or so. And, and there's a little veranda there and um, a place to and there's some tiles and there's a little kidney pool and there's some little flower garden over here and then um, there's a little pathway that goes down and there's a pond over here and then the, the, grass, the lawn goes down a long way and on the left side there's uh, some little fruit trees and then against that wall against this wall it's all trees so you're completely secluded in and um, the uh, the the grass was all trimmed. All around the place was trimmed. The pool was all cleaned out. The weather was phenomenal. The animals were just uh, loving it, outside loving it, cat and dog, outside loving it. And it began to dawn on me, truly dawn on me, it got up on me, about the wonder and the majesty and the goodness of God. It just got up on me. I have to tell you, when I sit down usually to rest, I got outside for a while. I'm resting physically. But I'm always keeping in mind the stuff that I need to do. So I'm not so sure I'm resting spiritually or emotionally or intellectually. I'm sort of resting physically. But I have to tell you, when God got up on me like that, and His glory got around me, and the goodness of God just began to sink into me, all of that faded away. All that concern and care faded away. Yes. And I began to rest spiritually and rest emotionally. And the care of it left me. Yes. And the care of it left me because of the goodness of God. Yes. And in that, I have to tell you, in that moment, I also saw the goodness of God. I saw it. Yes. Now, I'm made in the same image and likeness as Almighty God. And if He can see it, you can see it. You can see the goodness of God if you look for it. If you look for the goodness of God because it's there. Amen. You have to look for it or you have to be available for it. But let me say this to you. It wasn't like that the day before. The day before the place was a wreck. There the pool was trashed out. The grass was high. All kind of barbed stuff trying to get into our grass and all kind of stuff. There was trash from the pool to the pond all the way around the place. And the, the yard wasn't done in any way. Nothing was swept. And there was all kind of stuff that needed to be done. The place was an absolute wreck. And it was heavy. It's kind of heavy because there's so much you've got to do. That's right. well, without, without saying this the wrong way or embarrassing anyone, you know, Russell does so much that, that you don't even know. He serves you, the church, and he comes out 
and he labors for a whole day around our place making it beautiful. Yeah. He's doing that on to God, but he's doing it for you to bless us. And Lloyd was there. We had him clean stuff up all over the place and lay some salt and all kind of other stuff doing that. And Gary was planting flowers all over the place and I um, didn't blow the lawn and then the pool was a wreck and so uh, I don't like doing the pool but I you think, oh, big shot of the pool. It's not that way. And so, so we did all the pool and so the day before it was a mess. But there was an intentional desire for that to change. You follow what I'm saying? There was an intentional desire to get out of the malaise. To get out of the, just, the, just oh, hey, sarah, sarah, whatever it will be. Oh, there was an intentional desire to change that. And to find a way to make that right. And the glory of God was revealed in that. In the intention to do it. And I'm saying to you, in your life, that's a material thing. In your life, if you will make that determination towards God to serve Him, to do what He's asked you to do, if you will go after Him and not just sit and wait for something good to happen, not just sit in church, just don't do that any longer. There is no witness in it. If this scares you, this preaching, you still need to hear it. Everyone needs to hear it. God is calling every last person to give up this life and serve Him sacrificially. Every last one. And let me say this to you. This is where you're going to meet and encounter the goodness of God. He will meet you in this place as you serve Him, as you give your life for Him, as you sacrificially live before Him. He will meet you with this goodness. Yeah. Your life will light up. You will be radiant. Could you imagine what it was like for Moses? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. The goodness of God got all over Moses, did it not? He encountered Almighty God. Do you think his life was ever the same? Well, let me just say a few things in a little. This is the witness the Lord is waiting for. This is why he died. We are in his body. So much of our church is about being blessed, about being fed, about having our needs met. Now the Lord wants to do all these things. He just doesn't want to do them. He doesn't want them to be our primary focus. He's faithful. He'll do all those things. So we go fretting and worrying after them. Chasing after those. It's like we have no faith to believe it will do it His way. Seek the kingdom and righteousness. These things will come about. I just want to say a few scriptures that will finish. There's a little bit of a tricky concept here about being able to see the goodness of God. See it. See it. To be able to see it. Because when it's revealed, revealed, when it's manifest, it'll change everything. Psalm 23 and 6, Surely, goodness and love and kindness will follow me all the days of my life. Surely. If you're walking with Him, if you're sacrificially walking with Him, surely, goodness will do what? Follow you. Follow you. If you're serving Him, if you're simply in the center to the biblical text, if that's all you are in the center, there's no guarantee of this. Twenty-seven, Psalm twenty-seven, thirteen. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. The psalmist is saying, "If I don't encounter goodness, I will despair." without encountering the wonder of God coming to me, changing me. It is His goodness that changes you. It is His goodness by way of the Spirit that changes you. Psalm 1, 3 and 5. Who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The constant, constant witness to your spirit that He sees you, that He blesses you, that He knows you, and satisfies you with good things, things, His presence, stuff around you, and it renews your youth. Could anyone, well, the young people don't have to put their hand up, but those who are, wherever, could put their hand up. I want my youth renewed. I do. I really do. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> 
satisfies your years with good things. If you belong to Him, if you follow Him, if you sacrificially live before Him, if you love Him, if you'll do it no matter what. Sometimes you serve Him alone and no one else knows and no one else cares and you're at the very brink of giving up. Anyone been there? He says, go on, I see you. He says, that Jesus said in John 8, that the Father was always with him. He never left him. All the time. I urge you to take this to heart. I urge you. Well, we're not at the end. It says in Ecclesiastes 6 and 3, If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, however many they may be, but his soul is not satisfied with good things. You see, it is the goodness of God through things and through people and things like the good things that he can bring to you that satisfies your soul. That gives you satisfaction in life, makes life wonderful, makes life triumphant, makes life delightful, brings joy into your life when you're not always dealing with sorrow and defeat and never getting there. All right, I'm sort of belaboring and hammering. Finally, Romans 10 and 15. How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. All of God's good news has to do with good things. Salvation. A life to come. A beautiful life with Christ sacrificially. Now when you come for communion, um, you know, it's, it's for you to do this. And this week I would ask you to take stock in your life. What goodness do you see in your life that the Lord has brought you? Really search that out because this will bless you. Every place you see in your life where God has done you good. And you as a memorial give that back to God and say, God, you did good here in my life. You enriched my life. You blessed me here. I want to acknowledge the good that you did. Praise God for it and contemplate the wonder of it. Also ask yourself this question. Also, what good do others see in me? Ask yourself that question seriously. What good do others see in me? And then, <clears throat> I'll just ask you, um, what way are you witnessing to this lost and dying world? And finally, when was the last time you witnessed verbally? So it's not like you get out of witnessing verbally. So as we come, I know this was a little herky-jerky today, and I know, I know it's a difficult concept about the goodness of God, but the goodness of God is what keeps us, changes us, builds us, leads us forward. Now some, as you come to this altar, some God is talking to you, really he has, some he's talked to you. And some of you know that you're on this wrong side of things, where mostly it's a mental ascent. It's a mental ascent to what the guy, I believe this, I believe that. But there's no cost in your life. There's no evidence that you're doing any work. There's no evidence that you're serving God or serving humanity. There's no evidence that you're living sacrificially. There's no evidence anywhere in your life. And yet you think you're okay because you said, I believe this. But you're not okay. For that faith to be real, it's not just I believe this. It is I'm all in. I trust God completely. I will live before Him completely. Now you read it yourself. This is what James says. And our church and every church that belongs to Christ needs to hear this message. It needs to be shaken. Who is it here that will go to hell? Who? Maybe you've been in church 20 or 30 or 40 years and you still might be going to hell. Maybe. Maybe. I'm not your judge. What evidence can you give Christ? You know what he said? We did this, we did this, and this in your name. He said, I never knew you. You never lived for me. You never were sacrificed your life for me. You never did the work that I called you to do. All these things were on you, not on me. Let me close your eyes. Everyone close your eyes. Everyone.
I just want to say to you, some of you, some of you are being pierced and penetrated even now. Some of you. Some of you. And if what you thought was your salvation, but you find no evidence in your heart that you've ever done anything about it, that you can show good works to God, that you're sacrificially living, bearing the cross, and others can see good works in you. If that's you, if you've been in that way, ascending to belief, then I don't want you to raise your hand. I want you to raise your heart to God. While you're sitting there with no one around you, because it's small and it's intimate. But I want you to say, yes, God, I belong in that camp, and I don't want to be in that camp. I don't, God. And here's what he asks you to do. He asks you to surrender your life. First of all, he asks you to be aware that you're a sinner and you're destined for hell without his salvation. And to believe that he is the only one that can save you. So first you need to repent of your sins and tell him you're going to turn from doing anything that you want. Turn from doing whatever suits you. Turn and sacrifice your whole life to him. Turn. Turn from your sinful ways, is what the Bible says. So if you've not come to God, do that. Do that, and then tell him you want him to be Lord in your life. You believe that he is God, the Son of God. You believe in your heart. You confess with your mouth, Jesus is your Lord. And you as a slave, you as servant, and believe in your heart that God raised him the third day. That means you follow him with all your being. You surrender your whole life. It's not just saying, I believe this. It's surrender. It's trusting in Him for everything. If you've not done that, do that now. Pray to Him. Just pray to Him and say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me of my sins, my willful way. Forgive me of my indifference. Forgive me of just doing as I please. Forgive me or of not being concerned with the Christian witness, not being concerned with serving my neighbor, or living in any way that's sacrificial or cost me, forgive me, God. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I am sorry, God. True repentance has sorrow. And, oh God, I yield absolutely this moment before Almighty God. And this is you. I yield absolutely. Rush in, Holy Spirit, and fill me with the fullness of the life of Christ, that I would stand on Christ's finished work and I would live my entire life for Him and not for me. And I believe Him with all my heart and I promise to serve Him all my days and live before Him in a way that's pleasing. If that's you, pray a prayer like that so that you will be saved and then begin to do the works He is calling you to. Begin to do them. Whatever you see God calling you to do, do it. And don't just sit in church. And I know that's hard, but sometimes there isn't a way to get plugged in too easily. But you know, God is working with us. And God is changing us. And God is bringing the light of His gospel to every heart. So if you've said that prayer today, then you are saved in the name of Jesus Christ. And I would just wonder where every eye is closed and there's anyone while every eye is closed would raise a hand that they said that prayer. Is there anyone here? Okay, there are some here. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. So praise God. Several people prayed that prayer. So clap, give God glory for this. Isn't God wonderful? Bless the living God. Bless the living God.